webinar and welcome to American TESOL Presents Free Friday Webinars. I'm Shelly Sanchez Terrell, your hostess, and today I'm coming to you from San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> um, unfortunately, Roscoe's not with me, um, but today we're going to talk about level up, and level up is a term that you'll hear a lot of gamers use, and it's about creating digital games or playing digital games. So if you're a gamer or even if you're new to games and you're new to online gaming experiences, this webinar today is to teach you how you can use free tools on your uh, mobile device. Let's see if I can, um, I have my iPad mini here. Um, but how you can use that or even your cell phone and you can create really quick, fast games under five minutes. Um, and then that your students can do to show the learning. Um, but th this comes from my own experience teaching high school students, and I've taught students all over the world. So um, these are some of the things that I want to share with you today. You can always go to the bit.ly link, and I'll go ahead and put that there. And at the end, you can get all your bookmarks, um, but you can also get a certificate. So if you go download certificate, you'll get a certificate for attending this webinar. So. Why create video games? Well, um, when you're creating games, uh, it comes from the process of teaching others. With my learners, one of the things that I did back in 2004 was I thought, no, I don't want my learners to take these vocabulary quizzes. We had to take vocabulary quizzes every single Monday. It was a list of vocabulary words they would learn, they would memorize, they would take the quiz, and then they would forget those words. They wouldn't use them correctly, and I got tired of that. So what I began to do instead was I started telling them, um, you're going to create a crossword puzzle, or you can create a word jumble. You can create some kind of game. <coughs> Back then it was a board game, or if it was on paper. And uh, one of the things that I had was that I told them they would create that. And then what they would do is they would give this crossword puzzle, or um, they would give this, this game that they created, a board game. And what they would do is they'd give it to another student, and then whatever the student made on that vocabulary game is their grade. So this is what I had them do instead. A, it was more work for them, but while they're creating the crosswords, they have to write the definition. And so when they're making this and they're doing it with pen and paper on paper, um, they're learning the process, but while they're learning, they don't realize that they're learning the words as well because they had to do two things. They had to, one, they had to make... Um, they, they had to do the definition, but the other is they had to create a sentence with that hint, so like, sort of like a gap fill. And so this is what they did, and this is how they were graded. And they would grade each other because they're the ones who made the answer key and everything like that. It saved me time, but the students enjoyed this more. They liked it a lot more than having to take the regular vocabulary quizzes. So that's what I decided that I would do from now on because I just think it's a waste of time to quiz them on words that they just don't memorize. Well, now with digital tools, the great thing is that with digital tools online, there's so many free ones and there's free apps out there that make it an easy process so the students don't have to take all this time to create the game. Instead, what students can do is they can make a game in five minutes online and they can have they can email it to their friends and then they can whatever the the game itself automatically scores it so you don't have to score it and the student doesn't have to score it so my students like this better they think wow this is this is easier for them and takes a lot less time so I'm going to show you those kind of games but when we're thinking of games okay so I'm going to ask you a question that you can answer in the chat box right now game game are played by billions of people around the world. And which age group do you think plays the most video games right now? Which plays the most games? And these could be online games, any kind of games you can think of. But we are talking about digital games specifically. So these would be online or... So, okay, so Peggy thinks 14 to 18. And, and, and target group, we call this the target audience. A high school maybe. You'd be very surprised. The statistics show that women age of 50 years old are the highest age group to play video games. And this is why, because um, they consider the Facebook games as well. 
So if you play uh, Candy, my best friend, I'm at, actually at her house right now. Um, she loves playing the, I, I play Scramble, and I play um, Words with Friends, and she plays the, the Candy one. I don't, I don't even know what the Candy one is called. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So these are the kinds of games that they count as well. And so it is Candy Crush, yes. So we are part of the statistics. We are part of the statistics of women who play video games. And we don't think of this as gamers or, you know, we don't think of ourselves obviously as gamers. We don't think of ourselves always playing them. But um, obviously <laughs> play them up to be the highest growing category that plays games. And so, um, but why are we motivated through games? A lot of your students do play games, and that's why it's great to have them create their own games, and it's great for you to create games for them to play, because they found uh, with things like Worlds of Warcraft that there is millions of people around the world who learn how to speak English through Worlds of Warcraft. And the reason why is because it's a social game. They had to learn the English to um, get with their groups and to successfully complete the game. So that's one of the reasons why we play games and why games are so motivating is that they're social. You have to work with others nowadays. You see people with a headset. I used to see my um, ex-husband. I would walk in and he would be talking with his headset and he'd be playing someone on PlayStation 3 and he would be like a 15-year-old in another country. So. It, it, you play with people all over, you can speak to them, it's great for language learners. Um, it's a multimedia explosion. In other words, the games, when you're in these games, if you observe your teams in the game, it's very cool. It has graphics, it has music, it has really bright colors, so it immerses them in the world. It's very goal-oriented. When you um, play a game, there you know what you're supposed to do. You know what you're going to accomplish. And because you know that, you'll keep trying. Even if you fail the level, it, you can fail the level a hundred times, and you don't feel bad for failing the level a hundred times. You just keep trying and trying. So that's what we want our students to do. You want your students to love the task so much, whatever, a vocabulary list, learning math equations, learning science, learning the periodic table. You want it to be where they feel like they can try it a hundred times until they get it right. You want them to have that good motivation. Well, this is called try without penalty, and this is positive stress. So it is stressful for them to be in that situation, but they're learning. And they understand that failure is a part of it. They understand that you're going to fail, but you just try again. And that's a really powerful concept that we don't have currently in our school system. So when we have them create games, we can put that concept up. Is that it doesn't matter how many times you try, as long as you accomplish the goal, as long as you accomplish the task. And so that's, for me, that's what really um, was something that I could um, put into my lesson. So my students, a lot of times, they'll turn in something, um, and they may have tried it a hundred times till they got a hundred. But for me, that's okay. I don't get upset with that. I still give them the hundred because it doesn't matter that they um, did it a hundred times till they got the hundred. The, the fact that they found it worthy to study a hundred times is really just fantastic for me. The other thing is it's. Um, it's a, it, it, all of them feel like heroes at the end. When they accomplish it, they feel like they really did something really wonderful. They feel like they did something that was beyond their means, and they feel like they achieved something really great. So I think that's another part of it. Um, now, a lot of these ideas I learned also from Paul Maglioni. And Paul Maglioni um, did this thing. You can go to SlideShare. It's called uh, Team Motivation. But he talks a lot about teams and, and the way their brain functions and how their brain is, is, is geared for this kind of learning. So what can be games be used for? Well, so you may be like me where you have a set curriculum. Everything is time. And you may say, well, how am I going to fit a game into that? Well, the way I fit it was I replaced it as a test or a quiz. So I took out the multiple choice test. I took out all the multiple choice quizzes. Anything like that, any of the drilling I took out and I replaced it with them creating a game instead. And it became their mission. I don't give homework, I give missions. 
So I said, your mission is to create a game. And they could create the game any way they want. It's just they get a checklist. They have a rubric that they're graded by, but they also get a checklist. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Um, but it replaces the game or quiz. Um, OK, Peggy asked a very good question. She says, do you think games that are competitive are more motivating to clients than games that require collaboration? I don't know. It depends on the task. But I think that the drilling ones are the ones that you can, um, that you really can uh, do the, the challenging ones. And the competitive ones are actually pretty good right now um, as far as drilling goes. So I'll show you a few of those. You can decide on your own what you want to do, what's going to be. I think the easiest one to implement for teachers are the competitive ones. Um, and I know that's something. But I, I think if we start there first, it's a different type of competition. They're used to competing in games. They're used to winning and losing in games. And I think it's much different than grading. So I don't think it's the same kind of, um, like if, if in grades, somebody fails. But in a game, you don't really fail. You just, you know, you can try again to be the top of the leaderboard. That's the difference. Uh, so I think the competition is good there. Um, I use it for any type of drilling. And I also use it to visualize and experience a foreign concept. So for example, let's say that you're trying to teach them about, um, you, let's say that you're trying to teach them about physics or astronomy, and you're trying to teach them about history. Let's say the 1920s, OK? So you're, you're trying to go and you're ta teaching, you're talking about the 1920s, and you're using this archaic language, or the 1900s. They don't understand the language. They don't understand the world, because they don't get a world that isn't full of technology. They don't understand where people didn't have cell phones. They don't understand how people sent letters. They don't even know what a letter is. <laughs> they don't understand any of these things. They, and, and, and for us to think that they can understand this, well, you can do that in a game. They can play something like the Oregon Trail, and then they start to understand the history. And so it's better for them, because these are foreign concepts. It's, it's very difficult for even us to understand. The only reason why it's easier for us is because we had to go through that. But I remember the Oregon Trail was one of my favorite subjects. That was the favorite thing that I got to do, was because I understood what it was to be uh, someone who went on a trail and traveled and had to go through all those tough experiences, famine and all of this. I understood, and I still understand those concepts because I played the Oregon Trail. What game is this? Anybody have the most famous game that learners are playing nowadays? All learners around the world love this game. It has replaced um, uh, Oregon Trail. <laughs> yes, exactly. As Peggy said, it is Minecraft. And so a lot of teachers, including this one that I got the flicker from, Karen Jarrett, are using this to teach their learners. Because you understand different concepts in there. There's math, there's science, there's history, there's literature. There's so much you can do. Um, there's civilizations. There you're building. You're creating a world. And when you're creating that world that is physics, that's layout, that's design, there's so much that goes into that. You have to collaborate and plan. And so um, when you're starting out with games, one of the first things you want to do before they actually plan the game is they need that brainstorming time. When they're doing the brainstorming time, the first thing you're going to do is list their favorite game. Give me a list of what your favorite games are. Minecraft is going to be in there. <laughs> because all I just was in, um, in Croatia and Slovenia, and six-year-olds and nine-year-olds were all talking about Minecraft. So um, these are the kind of things that you can, you can um, put on there. So you list their favorite games. And then when they're listing their favorite games, have them write down the storyline of one of the games. So whether it be Minecraft, or whether it be World of Warcraft, or whether it be The Sims, whatever it is, games have a story. And, and they have a plot. And they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so that's one of the great language learners, is there's that storyline. And your students, when they're developing their own game, they're going to have a storyline. It could be something very simple. It could be something like, there's a monkey, and the monkey is throwing out bananas, and the bananas have letters, and you have to catch the bananas of letters. I mean, <laughs> so it could be a very simple game. 
doesn't have to be very complicated, but, you know, there's a game there. Um, so they write down the storyline and then have them create a walkthrough. What is a walkthrough? Well, a walkthrough is where they take screenshots of whatever the game is. Sometimes you can find it online. Sometimes you can put Minecraft walkthrough. Um, I'll show you a site in a little bit where you can find a bunch of walkthroughs. Um, and then what they do is each walkthrough, they, they put the picture. So, for example, here they would put the picture. They would put this picture, and next to it in the paper, they would be they would have like a paragraph or something, um, maybe something with bullets that actually says this is where the character does this, this is where the character has blocks, this is where the character um, builds by the river. So that is what a walkthrough is. It's basically going step by step by step and having what it is that you do in each step. Um, hi, Fabiana. <laughs> Um, so they will need to map out their, okay, and then they can map out their ideas because now they understand, they understand at a game, the games that they play have a story. And they understand it has to have a middle, a beginning, and an end. So we call this storyboarding. And they will need to map out their ideas. They will have to storyboard. This is what a storyboard template looks like. You can go to Google Docs. Um, and then you can you can type out storyboard. You can make it any way. They can draw this, um, or you can give them a handout. It's like a graphic organizer. So one of the things that you want to do is um, here they have the scene. That is where they draw the picture. They can post. Sometimes my students post pictures from um, from Flickr. They do Creative Commons pictures, and they put it there. They put the voiceover text, the sound or music that's going to go with it, and the notes. Um, and they, the notes are usually like a description. So what does scene one have? Well, in scene one, the character comes. The character is, um, so they want an overall description, like, OK, there's a prince. He has to conquer a dragon and save a princess. This is the game, OK? And then scene one is the princess wakes up. She's caught. Scene two, she's caught by a dragon. Scene three enters the prince. So. <laughs> They can make a game such as this, or they may do something like the monkey. Okay, there's a monkey. Scene two, all the letters come out in different bananas. Scene three, um, you catch the bananas to spell a word that comes out. You win, you lose. So the, this is their way of visualizing it. After they do this, now this you can either do on a computer. You can even do it on a laptop. You can use something like Edu Creations. You can use um, different types of apps if you want. You can do it on a Google Doc. That's fine. Um, but you don't have to. You can do this step before, let's say that you can borrow the, the computer lab for one day. So you do the storyboard template by hand with colors and crayons. That's what I've had students do. And then when they go into the, uh, the computer lab, they already have their game planned out. So within that, 15, 20, 30 minutes that you have with them in the computer, you say that's what the time you have to get your game done. So they have it planned out ahead of time. There are online sites that are very, very good for that. There's um, this one that is called um, a Storyboard Generator. You can build your own. Your students can go on the computer, and they can make it. They upload their own photos. They have an introduction. It walks them through the process. It even makes their own movie about it. Storyboard that is another really great one. Poplet is really great. All they do, and then the great thing about Poplet is it has if you do it on the on the browser version, so you can do it on the browser poplet.com, um, and it's free. Then they can add pictures from Flickr. They can search YouTube videos. Um, so there's so many things they can do. All they do is they put the name of their game there. Um, they put a little note that says what their game is about, a basic description. They put another node that says the characters, OK? Another node from the characters says Prince Alexander, Princess Kabudu, um, the dragon Dracos, you know, whatever they want to name it. And then here they can put pictures of each of them. Uh, what happens? The dragon steals the princess. The princess says, ah, uh, you know, so they can, they can map it out in detail here with Poplet. Um, and this is Poplet looks like. So you can do a search. You just click on Flickr there. And then you can do a search, or you can do your own. The great thing is you can also draw. So if you did this on, um, you can click on here, and you can draw it. So they can even draw the dragon or anything like that. They don't necessarily. They can use their own type of um, 
drawings as well. And so that's what they get my learners to do. I've done this with four to six year olds in um, in Germany. I taught my four to six year olds, and we would use their drawings. So that's one of the things that was um, that we would do. So which tool or app? Well, whatever tool or app you're going to use, there's a lot of free ones. It depends on you. It depends on your situation. So, for example, if you have a, um, it depends. Do you have one computer? I've done this with one computer. I've done this with um, an iPad. I've done this with a mobile device. So it's up to you. What do you have available? Do you have a computer lab and it's only for 30 minutes? then that's going to be your planning. Then you're going to do the storyboard in class with pen and paper and crayons maybe or map pencils and then you're going to go up and everybody's going to get it done there. Maybe you have them work in pairs. A lot of times I'll have them work in pairs and they can create the game together. Um, if you have limited things, if you have a cart, if you have a cart of devices or if you're sharing devices, do you have a mobile device? then you're going to use a free mobile app. And actually, the mobile apps are the best tools to use. You can literally create a game in five minutes and send it to somebody else, and it's an awesome game. Um, the ones that are online take a little bit longer. Um, internet speed, um, how fast, you know, do you have the internet for a short time? Is it because if you're using graphics and you want to use something that's fast, it's not going to take students long if you have a slow internet connection. Um, student technology, what do they have at home? So if they don't get it done, can they work on it at home? Um, that's something that you need to consider. If not, then you need to try a, a really simple drilling game, something where they can make it in 10 minutes tops. And how much time do you have? So I'm going to show you a few really ones. Um, the easiest ones I'm going to show you first. One of them is Zondo.com. And um, you can create quizzes and games, and you can create phonics games as well. The good thing about Zondo, when you go to Zondo and you create an account, um, you do have to create an account. These are the kind of games. What is the capital of Portugal? Faro. Okay, so it has all these capitals. These are the kind of games you can do. The great thing about Zondo is you can take somebody else's idea, you can take their games, the hundreds and hundreds of games that teachers have made. They have a library of thousands of questions, and it's drag and drop. So you basically, you choose a thousand, you type in the subject. First you have to type in, do you want them to learn history? Do you want them to learn capitals? You get to decide what it is. Mine were always the vocabulary list. That's where I started. Every single week I took the vocabulary. They didn't do vocabulary quizzes. They didn't do the history quizzes. That's what the game was. So they took those questions, the thousands of questions we could search. Are we doing the presidents? Are we doing capitals of countries? Are we doing um, geography, a delta? Um, are we doing math? Are they learning geometry shapes? Anything like that. So they don't have to start from scratch exactly. They can just do it from there. Kahoot is another one. Kahoot is very, very easy to do. The students love it. Um, you make the first quiz. You put up pictures. Um, and this is trivia. It's like if you go to a famous restaurant like Friday's or something, and you have those game quizzes, the trivia, and what they do is they can actually make a trivia quiz. When they make the trivia quiz, it has a countdown. So it's actually counting it down. Your students don't actually have to sign up or register. Um, what happens is that you, you have a class code, so they go to the site, they type, whatever, it gives you a link, they type in the class code, and it gives them the trivia. And then it gets them to create their own trivia game. So then it goes, yay, George finished the fast. It puts them all on the leaderboard, and then they can keep playing <laughs> until they get it right. So that's, and they create their own trivia game, drag and drop. And then the students, they, they're prompted by Kahoot after they take your quiz, so the great thing about Kahoot is you can give your own the first vocabulary quiz, and so they can get an idea of what it is. And then from then on, your students can make this. Um, my um, my 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 boyfriend uh, Jake, he does this with his um, sixth graders. There, he has 178 of them. They um, speak different languages. Some of them um, speak uh, Spanish. Others speak other languages as well, um, Portuguese and things. And they love this. This is their favorite way to make um, quizzes and games. And they make them for their peers. And they want to do it again and again. And they want to do it times because they want to be George. They want to be each other. Um, so they do that a lot. 
Um, ClassTools.net is very easy. It has three um, or four different templates. So your students get a choice of those three, and they can easily make any of them. Um, this is from Russell Tarr. Russell Tarr is amazing. He's in um, Toulouse, France, and he makes all of these types of great tools that are free for um, students and teachers. So you can go here, and you can um, have any of these games that your students can make. Stencil.com is another really great one. Um, you can make a different um, games as well. This one I actually learned from Digital Play Info. And so if you go to the Digital Play blog, they're the ones that have all the free walkthroughs. They also have lesson plans that work with games. So um, Stencil is a great one. It's Splash-based. So you actually download this. This is software. The other ones are online. And so you have to use them on a computer, internet connected. But Stencil, you can actually download this to your um, to your one computer if you don't have internet connection all the time. And then you can just have it there all the time for the students to use. And then you can upload it online when they're finished creating their game. Um, Stencil, they can even make games that are made to be played on any type of device. So once you make it on Stencil, you can you can make it to where it's an app, your game. You can make it um, to where it's online and where it's an Android, any of those. The great thing is it has templates. So the students can choose between making a maze, a ping pong template, role playing. Role playing is the best one, I think, um, because role playing is where they actually have words. That's where they can do things like an adventure game, like words and dragons. Um, they have an alien game and, and many, many more. Scratch. Now, you can even try Scratch. Scratch is browser-based, but the great thing about Scratch is, sorry, <laughs> a little painful here. Um, scratch is that you don't have to register. So once you do Scratch, um, uh, no, actually, that's great, Peggy. Peggy asked a great question. You can do it offline. With Dental, you can create it offline. Um, it's software, so you create it on your computer. It's like... Um, Windows Media uh, Movie Maker or something. It's something that you can download to your computer. So if you have, you have to think if you have space on your computer for it too. Scratch is sort of the same way too. You can create it. Um, the great thing is you can create it online as well. You can use other people. People have made thousands and thousands of scratches, um, video games. This is from MIT. And so you can just replicate theirs. It's called remixing. So you just take a game you like. And then you make it for your own. <laughs> so it's very easy to do. You don't have to register. You can actually play around. And the great thing is it gives you a storyboard. It gives you the storyboard template. You can see where there's drawing. You have all these options. You can add text. You can add sound. Um, over here they have sounds that are embedded as well. Um, and they have a library of characters. That's a famous Scratch cat character. But there's many, many characters on there as well. Um, and, and so you can take all of these and you just make whatever sound. You just click it, you drag it, you drop it in the storyboard, and that becomes part of the game. So it's, it, you can see it go along. And it also has step-by-step -step intro, so it shows you how to do it. Scratch takes a little bit longer um, instead of just going and having a template and then just adding the words or the, anything like that. Scratch, you can make your own personalized, really great game. So this is something that if you do have access to computers for a while, or you have two or three times you can go to the computer lab, that's something you want to do. But you can make something very simple. This is a French game I found there. And one of the things that they did is you, um, it gives you a sound. The teacher actually speaks the sound. And then you have to choose the letter that is that sound. So it's like a phonics game. Adventure Game Studio is something you download as well. It only works with PC. It doesn't work with Mac, which is what I found. Um, but you play wonderful, beautiful. Um, you can make these beautiful adventure games that I really like. I think they're gorgeous. The great thing about adventure games is um, if you're teaching something like history and you're teaching the 1900s, then this is when I would have them create an adventure game. If it's a whole unit and I really want them to understand something like Japanese and Kampan, in camp 
math encampment. Um, or I want them to understand something like World War I or something like this where I just think it's beyond their grasp. Like I just don't think they're going to be able to understand it unless they're immersed in the world. Then this is something that I want them to do. Um, you could do text adventure games. This is all completely text-based. This is where you're in a writing class. If you have an essay, if you work with students and it's writing essays like I have with my high school students, then this is one of the games that they can play. They can add video. They can add, um, but a lot of it is what it is, is it's interactive text. So they write the basic plot, but whoever plays the game can respond. They have to respond by typing in text. They have to answer questions. Sort of like a choose your own adventure game in a way. And then there's other ones. There's like serendipity. Um, it's another one that's sort of like one of these games where you just create your own like Zondo or something like that. But Zondo is the easiest one. And then there's apps. So I'm going to show you the apps because I think the apps are the best ones. It's the fastest way to make one. So if you have apps, this is the best way to do it. The first one is Tiny Tap. Tiny Tap is my favorite game creation one. Um, you make it on the iPad, but even if you make it on the iPad, um, the great thing about it is that you also can make it to where it's um, played online. So you can go to tinytap.it and you'll find all these wonderful games people have made. You upload your own photos and then it has um, your own images or you can do a web search. You can record your own voice. You record a question and answer a hint. So it's easy. You make it in five minutes. You can literally make it in five minutes. Um, 20 different soundtracks in the background. So it's really pretty and nice. Let me see if I can find my scratch um, so you can get an idea from my mini. I'm pretty sure that I, I mean my, uh, my tiny tap. Okay, so tiny tap is this little icon. You can see it's the little glasses. So I'm going to do that one. Let's see. And it's so cute. It has like a little bear with glasses. There you go. <laughs> Welcome to tiny tap. Okay, let's see what Tiny Tap does. Oh, it's muted. Okay, let's make it louder. Okay, so next, uh, you says turn your photos into games. We're going to go to recreate a game. So it gives you three options here. You can create a game, you can record questions, or you can uh, trace the answers. So we're going to create a game. Um, okay, here's one called Who is Bigger? So it gives me a template here. I can do this one, Who is Bigger, and make my own from scratch. And so we're going to play this one. So you can get an idea of the kind of games you can make. Page one of eight. Okay. Who is bigger? <laughs> I guess that one. And you have a balloon that comes. I don't know why it's not making a sound. Why? Did I? Oh, there it is. Okay, let's see if I can make the sound louder now. Okay, so here we go. Who is bigger? Well, the cat is bigger. So I'm going to press it. And then it gives a balloon because I got it right. So somebody did that. Right now it's not making sound. I don't know why it's not making a sound. Um, but you can create them as well. It's really simple to create. When you create, you get different pages. So it gives you different pages. It's very easy. Um, and that's one of the things that you can do with it. Um, game press is where you can make something a little bit more detailed, so it's more like an adventure game. Um, you can drag and drop. You have over 500 graphics, music, sound effects, particle effects. It even, um, this is my favorite part of this one, is that it has a physics engine for real world simulation. So if you're teaching physics, you're teaching something like this, and you want them to invent something, and you want them to test the physics concepts, um, then this is something that you would have them use as well. They can even create their own sound and special effects. This takes a little bit longer, and the reason why Game Press takes so long is because you have so many different options. It's just full of options. So I find that the more options you have, the longer you're going to take. So have them take each other's games, and then they can assess them. So after they take a game, that's their score. They can send you the score. I have them send it um, via a Google form. So you can you can do a Google form where you can take all of these answers. They actually go, they enter their thing, they take a screenshot for me, um, which is easily. And what they do is that they can 
take the screenshot and they send it so I know that the score is right, okay? Um, this is what a rubric looks like. Now, Scratch has a lot of rubrics, so whatever game you use, um, that's the kind of rubric you want to you want to search for. So here, content area concepts um, does does not include ideas about the subject area or ideas are correct. So these are ones that you can use. Project design did not try to make their own artwork because you want them to make their own artwork. No clear purpose or uh, of project or organization. They just threw something out there. Does not provide a way for other people to interact with the program. So these are the things that you're assessing. Project shows me understanding of blocks and how they work together. Um, lacks organization. Has several bugs. The student under the process did not get involved to design the process. Did not. So you decide with the rubric, and that tells them how they create the game. Um, with mine, it says something, for example, like they have to have five of the vocabulary words or ten. They have to have the right definitions. They have to have grammar correct. So these are things that are part of my rubric, um, and that's how you would grade. You can use something called Gubric if you go on to um, uh, Google. And if you use it on Google, if you do everything through Google, then you can easily assess it that way. And this is what they have as the walkthrough. So this is a walkthrough for one of these famous games. You can go to bit.ly. And if you go to bit.ly, and you go to 1, 2, what is it? 1, 2, I3? I3, maybe, yeah. Um, and that's capitalized, E-P-M. I think that's it. Um, then you can go there, and you can go ahead, and you can find this walkthrough activity. It's a lesson plan for teachers, so then you can go and you can see what a walkthrough is. Um, oh, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Um, let me get you the bit.ly. Okay, so when you do this, um, the great thing about it is that you you see what a walkthrough is. Um, it tells you the different parts of the game. But for your students, you can have it to where they take the screenshots and they tell you they just descriptions. Um, and then you can have them say what they're supposed to do within the game for more complicated games. I embed these on a wiki or a blog. So a lot of times, if they have their own blog, if they have a kid blog, then the students can post them up there. They don't have to email the game. They can embed them somewhere. They can upload them somewhere. A wiki is a great place to embed all of the games. Um, and then, of course, you can find all of these resources booked here at this pearl tree. So um, those are the different types of game options that I have put. I know there's plenty of more out there. There's hot potatoes, so they can actually do um, those kind of games that are crosswords. That's what I had them do. But now I like them to make those drilling games. Uh, Tiny Tap is a good resource. Um, and you can also go here to the bit.ly address and get your um, stuff. So thank you so much, and thank you for the suggestions in the chat box. You can always go and you can copy and paste the chat box, and then you'll have all of these ideas in place. Um, but also, if you go to the bit.ly address, in about five or 10 minutes, you'll see you can have the slides. Um, you can also have um, all of the bookmarks as well. So thank you so much, and I appreciate you being here. Have a great weekend. If you have any questions, just